What plays the role of force in rotation? You have had experiences that illustrate how torque works. Suppose you want to push open a door that rotates about its hinges. You know that the speed with which the door opens depends on how hard you push. It also depends on how far from the hinges you push the farther the faster. It also depends on the angle at which you push. Pushing at a right angle to the door is much more effective than pushing at a smaller or larger angle. If you push at a right angle, then torque equals the force times the distance from the axis of rotation. With nothing to technically push against in space, it seems odd that rockets could accelerate in space. The explanation is that the force of the combusting rocket fuel itself pushes the rocket, accelerating it forward. What plays the role of mass in rotation? Mass is defined as the net force on an object divided by its acceleration. By analogy, then, the property that takes the place of mass should be the torque divided by angular acceleration. The property is called rotational inertia or the moment of inertia. It depends not only on mass, but on how far the mass is from the axis of rotation. The further the mass is from the axis, the larger the moment of inertia. If you sit on a swiveling stool or chair while holding heavy weights, the further you extend your arms, the more difficult it is for someone to start you rotating. That is, it will require more torque to achieve the same angular acceleration. What was the first type of bridge? The first type of bridge ever used was a beam bridge. This bridge was probably just a fallen tree that was used to cross a ravine or a small stream. The tree was probably supported by the riverbed or by a group of rocks. Beam bridges consist of a horizontal roadbed supported by vertical piers on the shores that are planted in the ground. Beam bridges are limited by the resistance of the roadbed to bending. What is the tallest structure ever built? Structures and towers are listed separately from skyscrapers. The Warsaw Radio Tower on the outskirts of Warsaw, Poland, was the tallest structure ever built. Although it needed to be supported by long cables to keep it up. The tower reached 646 meters, 2,119 feet, into the sky. Unfortunately, in August 1991, the tower came crashing down during repair work. The tallest structure ever built that is still in existence is the KTHITV Tower in North Dakota, which stands with the help of cable 629 meters, 2,063 feet, tall. 
The tallest self-supporting tower in the world is the Canadian CN Tower. Whose tip is 553 meters, 1815 feet, above the city of Toronto. How are gears used today? In addition to automobiles and clocks, gears are used in washing machines, electric mixers, and can openers. And electric drills, as well as hard drives and CD-slash-DVD drives in computers. Today much of the development of gears is associated with improvements in the materials used. New metal alloys increase the lifetime of gears used in automobiles and industries. Consumer electronics uses plastic gears that require no lubricant and are quiet. What challenges are there in building skyscrapers? The first challenge is to design a foundation that can support the tremendous weight of a large building. The best way is to dig down to the bedrock. This can be as close as about 21 meters, 70 feet. In New York City to almost 61 meters, 200 feet, in Chicago. If the distance is short holes can be bored and concrete piers can be formed in the holes. More frequently a caisson is required. This is a large hollow waterproof structure that is sunk through the mud. Pulling it into and then out of the top of the caisson. A third method is go build a large steel and concrete underground pad that floats on the top of a hard clay layer. The load that the foundation must support includes the weight of the building, its furnishings and equipment, and the changing load of occupants. In addition to the loads, strong winds must also be considered. The walls of early tall buildings were construct of masonry that supported the weight of the building. The 16-story 65.5 meter, 215 foot, high Manadnock building in Chicago. Built from 1889 to 1891, required 1.8 meter, 6 foot, thick walls at the base. It was so heavy that it sank requiring steps to be constructed between the sidewalk and the ground floor. The second half of the building used a steel frame on which masonry was attached, allowing much wider windows to be used. The steel frames can be bolted, riveted, or welded together. When the 59-story, 279 met ER, 915 foot tall city group building was constructed in new york city from 1974 to 1977 the frame was bolted together but later computer models showed that if hurricane strength winds struck the building it would be in danger of collapse as a hurricane moved up the eastern seaboard in 1978 workers hurriedly welded plates over the bolted joints. Luckily the hurricane moved out to sea, sparing New York. Another effect of winds on tall buildings is to make them sway back and forth. While a variety of braces can reduce the sway, they add weight to the building. Another method is now used. 
The city group building has a 400 ton concrete damper at the top. The damper moves back and forth, opposing the wind driven motion of the building and reducing sway. Dampers, both liquid and solid, are used in tall buildings. Towers, offshore oil drilling platforms, bridges, and skywalks. The 210 meter, 690 foot, Burj Al Arab Hotel in Dubai has 11 mass dampers. The dampers can also mitigate the effect of earthquakes. Transporting large numbers of people into and out of upper floors is a challenge too. Those who design the elevator systems, as was demonstrated in the collapse of the world, Trade Center buildings on September 11, 2001, stairways can be used in emergency situations. But the simultaneous movement of occupants down and firefighters up the stairways caused severe problems. Another consideration is the safety of occupants in case of fire. Some buildings have entire floors designed to be especially fire resistant. So that people could gather there and be safer than on other floors. Where is the longest bridge in the United States? The longest bridge in the United States, a SUS pension bridge, ranks as the sixth longest bridge in the world. The Verrazano Narrows Bridge is between Staten Island and Brooklyn, New York. This bridge, completed in 1964, spans 1,298 meters, 4,260 feet. The span between the towers of the Mackinac Bridge that links the upper and lower peninsulas of Michigan at 1,158 meters. 3,800 feet, is shorter than that of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. But when measured by the distance between the cable anchorages it is the longest. Bridge in the Western Hemisphere the length of the entire bridge, shore to shore, is 5 miles. How are clocks important to the development of gears? As clocks have improved, so have the gears used within them. The pendulum clock uses a type of a gear called an escapement to drive the pendulum. Which regulates the time marked out by the clock. Precision gears allow clocks to use less power and have greater accuracy. Does momentum apply to objects that rotate? Quantities that describe rotation are similar to but different than those that describe straight line motion. Position is replaced by angle, velocity by angular rotation. Acceleration by angular acceleration. Force is replaced by torque. What are gears and why are they simple machines? Gears are toothed wheels which transmit torque between two shafts. 
the teeth prevent them from slipping, so they are called positive drives. The smaller gear in a pair is called a pinion and the larger one a gear. Because the teeth mesh, in a given amount of time. The number of teeth engaged on the pinion equals the number on the gear. The number of teeth is proportional to the circumference of the gear that in turn, is proportional to the radius of the wheel. Therefore if the pinion makes one turn, the gear will make, or pinion slash regier, turns. Because energy is conserved. The torque exerted by the gear equals the torque applied to the pinion, regier slash or pinion. Gears are often used in an automatic transmission, converting the high speed. Small torque output of the engine to the low speed, large torque output needed to turn the wheels. This kind of gear drive is called a step-down drive. On the other hand, in a windmill, the blades turn at a low speed but provide a large amount of torque. The gear drive in a windmill is a step-up drive. The electric generator, on the other hand, requires high speed, but can work with a smaller amount of torque. Gears also allow a bicyclist to match the speed with which she can rotate the pedal sprocket with the speed needed to drive the wheels. How can you reduce the bending of a beam bridge? The simplest way to keep the roadbed from bending is to use a king post. In the illustration below, the downward force of the center of the bridge pulls down on the vertical post. This places the diagonal braces under compression. They transmit the force to the pairs. The upward force on the post makes the net force on the post zero. It is under tension. While the king post bridge can reduce the bending in the center of the bridge, it can do nothing about bending between the pier and the bridge center. One solution is to add a second vertical post and connect the two by a horizontal member. Creating a queen post bridge. But a method that allows much more support on a longer bridge is the truss. Similar methods of translating downward forces to compression forces exerted on the Piers on the ends of the bridge were known to the Romans who worked in stone and concrete. They were famous for the arches used in their massive aqueducts. One such aqueduct, the Pont du Gard, was completed in 18 BCE and was used to carry water a length of 270 meters. 886 feet, over the Garden River Valley in southern France. Cables suspending or holding up the roadbed are draped over a set of tall vertical towers called pylons. The pylons support the suspension cables from which vertical cables are attached that lift the deck. The ends of the SUS pension cables must be anchored into the ground. At each end of the bridge to exert the tension forces on the cables. The first known suspension bridge was constructed in the 7th century. CE by Mayans at their capital Ixchilan, Mexico. It spanned 100 meters.
why is it easy to tip over some objects? If you want to tip something over you'll have to rotate it. As you have seen, rotation means you need to apply a torque. An object sitting on a surface has several forces on it. First, is the gravitational force that acts on its center of gravity. Second, is the upward force of the surface. Third, is friction between the object and the surface that exists only if the surface is on a slant. Now suppose you exert a sideways force near the top of a box. That creates a torque and the box begins to rotate. What is the newest hybrid of bridges? One of the newest, prettiest, and most economical bridges is the cable stayed suspension bridge. With its sleek lines and thin roadways, it is the perfect bridge for most mid span designs. The Tatara Bridge, in Onomiki, Japan. Completed in 1999, is the longest cable stayed bridge in the world, with a span of 890 meters. 2,919 feet. Cable stayed bridges SUS pen the roadbed by attaching multiple cables directly to the deck supporting the roadbed. These cables are then passed through a set of tall vertical towers and attached to abutments on the ground. Such engineering methods reduce the need for heavy expensive steel and the massive anchorages that are needed to support suspension bridges. What plays the role of momentum in rotational motion? The angular momentum of a rotating object is proportional to the product of its moment of inertia and its angular velocity. If there are no external torques on the object, then its angular momentum does not change. An object with linear momentum that has no external forces on it cannot change its mass so its velocity is constant. But a rotating object can change its moment of inertia, so even without external torques, its rotational speed can be changed. What is energy? An object with energy can change itself or its environment. That's a pretty abstract definition. Let's explore some of the many ways an object can have energy and what changes it can cause. A speeding car has energy think what damage it can do if it hits a wall or another car. The energy of motion is called kinetic energy. A rotating wheel also has energy if you try to stop a spinning bicycle wheel with your hand, it may hurt you. This kind of energy is called rotational kinetic energy. A compressed spring or a stretched rubber band can cause a stone to move. The energy in the squeezed spring or stretched band is called elastic energy. 
there are a variety of other forms of energy that are stored in a material. The random motion of the atoms that make up the material means that the atoms have kinetic energy. A measure of the amount of the kinetic energy in the random motion of the atoms is called temperature. The more energy, the higher the temperature. Kinetic energy in the random motion of atoms in a material is called thermal energy. If you charge or discharge a battery, like the one in your cell phone, you change the chemical composition of the battery materials. When you charge it you increase its chemical energy. You can also increase the chemical energy of your body by eating. Even mass has stored energy splitting the nucleus of a uranium atom results. In elements that have smaller mass but a large amount of kinetic energy. What are other examples of the conservation of momentum? If there is only one object in the system, then with no external forces Newton's second law says that its velocity will not change. Conservation of momentum also says that its momentum won't change. If the momentum was zero, it will remain zero. If you shoot a rifle or shotgun you are often told to hold the gun tightly against your shoulder. What's the physics explanation for this admonition? When the gun is fired the bullet's momentum changes. Its new momentum is in the forward direction. So, AC according to the law of conservation of momentum the gun must gain momentum. In the opposite direction, it will recoil. If the gun isn't held tightly to your shoulder its mass is relatively small, and so its recoil velocity will be large. When it hits your shoulder it could cause injury. If, on the other hand, the rifle is tight against your shoulder, then the mass is the mass of the rifle and your body. The recoil velocity will be much smaller. Momentum backward. With no external forces on the rocket gas system. The rocket's momentum must increase in the forward direction. It will speed up. When the rocket is on the launch pad there is an external force on it, the force of gravity. What is the tallest building in the world? The tallest building, until recently, was the Sears Tower, now the Willis Tower. In Chicago, Illinois, which was built in 1974 and is 443 meters, 1,453 feet, high. Three new skyscrapers in Asia now surpass this height. The Petronas Towers in Malaysia, completed in 1996, are 452 meters, 1,483 feet, high. The Shanghai World Finance Center in China, completed in 2008, stands 492 meters, 1,614 feet, high almost half a kilometer into the sky. The Burj Dubai, Dubai Tower, 818 meters, 2,684 feet, 
High, the world's highest, opened in January 2010. How can athletes use angular momentum? Let's explore two different sports. In platform diving a person pushes off the tower. And thus the platform exerts a force on her, Newton's third law. But, if she isn't standing straight up, the force also exerts a torque on her, and starts her rotating. If she pulls her arms and legs in, then her mass is closer to her axis of rotation. And her speed of rotation increases. To slow this rotation, she can extend her arms and legs. With good timing, she can hit the water with a bare minimum of rotation. Consider a figure skater. She can start spinning on the point of one skate by pushing on the ice with the second skate. Again, the force of the ice exerts a torque, and so her rotational speed increases. She can extend her arms to slow the rotation. Or pull them in as close as possible to attain the highest spin rate. But who made it and where? It is uncertain, but likely to have been made in one of the colonies of Corinth on the island of Sicily. Perhaps by a student of Archimedes decades after he was killed. One method of creating a pulley with a variable diameter is to use a V-shaped belt and a pulley with a groove that can be adjusted in width. This kind of transmission is often used with hybrid cars. And is being developed as a means of decreasing fuel use. How did gears play a role in an ancient astronomical computer? In the 1st century B. CE a Roman merchant ship carrying Greek treasures to Rome sank. In 1900 CE a storm. Caused a party of Greek sponge divers to seek shelter on the island of Antikythera. After the storm passed the divers, seeking sponges, found the wreck of the Roman ship. Over the next nine months they recovered much of the treasure. Including a badly corroded block the size of a telephone book. A few months later it fell apart, showing remains of bronze gears. Plates covered with scales, and inscriptions in Greek. The German scientist Albert Rem, 1871-1949. Understood in 1905 that the device was an astronomical calculator. In 1959 the American historian of science Derek de Sala Price, 1922-1983. Wrote a Scientific American article describing some of the details of the device and the calculations it could do. By 1974 he had described 27 gears including the number of teeth on most. By analyzing the teeth he discovered that the ratio could describe lunar cycles known by the ancient Babylonians. 
the Antikythera device can predict solar and lunar eclipses. The dates of future Olympic Games, and can show the complicated motion of the Moon. The precision with which the gears were made was greater than any made in the world for the next thousand years. When tossed in the air, why do hammers wobble and over end? In earlier chapters we considered only point objects. That is, an object so small that it could be thought of as the tiniest ball. Now we want to expand our considerations to large objects. First think of a baseball. If a baseball is tossed into the air, the ball follows a smooth parabolic path as described earlier in this book. If, however, a hammer is tossed its path appears much more complex. Why? All objects are made of atoms. The mass of the object is the sum of the masses of all the atoms. And the force of gravity on each atom is proportional to the mass of that atom. In a baseball the center may be made of different materials than the surface, but if you ignore the laces, the ball is made up of the same materials regardless what the direction is. That is, the ball is spherically symmetric. The center of gravity in any object is defined as the average location of its weight. Because the mass is distributed evenly throughout a baseball. The center of gravity is located in the center of the ball. However, for an object such as a hammer, with a metal head and a wooden handle. The center of gravity is not directly in the middle. Since more mass is located in the metal head of the hammer, the center of gravity is closer to that point. The laws of physics state that the center of gravity follows a parabolic curve when tossed in the air. Indeed, although the ball and the hammer do not appear to have similar motions. Their centers of gravity do. If you watch closely both the center of a baseball and the center of gravity of a hammer. You will see that they both follow parabolic paths when thrown. Because the force of gravity is proportional to the mass. The center of mass is at the same location as the center of gravity. If you stand with your back against a wall, can you bend forward so the trunk of your body is horizontal? Most likely if you're male you will tend to fall forward. While if you're female you are more likely to be successful. Again, the question is whether or not the center of gravity of your body is above your point of support in this case your toes, or in front of it. What is the difference between a dead load and a live load? In order to remain static, bridges, and all structures, for that matter, must be able to withstand loads placed on them. A load is simply the engineering term for force. 
Dead load is the weight of the bridge or structure itself. The live load, on the other hand, is the weight and forces applied to the bridge. As a result of the vehicles and people that move across the bridge at any one time. Of course, in order to be safe, engineers account for much higher live loads than would normally occur. What does it mean to say that water seeks its own level? The surface of water placed in a single container, a glass or a bathtub or a lake, will remain at the same level relative to earth on both sides of the container. Adding water to one side will only make the entire level uniformly rise. There can never be one section of the glass or tub or lake that is at a higher elevation than another section. To understand this fact, consider adding the small cube of water on top of the surface at one location. It would exert a downward force on the water under it. But, because water can flow, water under it would flow outward. Raising the level elsewhere in the container until the pressure is equal everywhere. Water also seeks its own level in other containers. If you fill a hose or tube with water and hold the tube in a U-shape, the water level will be at the same locations in the two ends. You can use the U-tube to make a device to show you equal heights at two different locations. You may have a coffee maker that has a water height indicator on the side. This is a small tube that connects to the water reservoir at the bottom. The water level in the narrow tube and the wide reservoir is the same. What does it mean to say that water seeks its own level? The surface of water placed in a single container, a glass or a bathtub or a lake, will remain at the same level relative to earth on both sides of the container. Adding water to one side will only make the entire level uniformly rise. There can never be one section of the glass or tub or lake that is at a higher elevation than another section. To understand this fact, consider adding the small cube of water on top of the surface at one location. It would exert a downward force on the water under it. But, because water can flow, water under it would flow outward. Raising the level elsewhere in the container until the pressure is equal everywhere. Water also seeks its own level in other containers. If you fill a hose or tube with water and hold the tube in a U-shape, the water level will be at the same locations in the two ends. You can use the U-tube to make a device to show you equal heights at two different locations. You may have a coffee maker that has a water height indicator on the side. This is a small tube that connects to the water reservoir at the bottom. The water level in the narrow tube and the wide reservoir is the same. What are the units used to measure pressure? Pressure is force divided by area. 
so in the metric system pressure is measured in newtons per square meter, called a pascal, pa. 1 pascal is a very small pressure, so usually the kPa, or 1000 pa, is used. In the English system, pounds per square inch, psi, is often used. Another unit used is a measurement of the height of mercury in a glass. Tube that would create a pressure that balances the pressure of the fluid. That unit that used to be called millimeters of mercury is now called the tor. Here is how these units compare. 760 tor equals 14.7 psi equals 101.3 kPa. What are the units used to measure pressure? Pressure is force divided by area. So in the metric system pressure is measured in newtons per square meter, called a pascal, pa. 1 pascal is a very small pressure, so usually the kPa, or 1000 pa, is used. In the English system, pounds per square inch, psi, is often used. Another unit used is a measurement of the height of mercury in a glass. Tube that would create a pressure that balances the pressure of the fluid. That unit that used to be called millimeters of mercury is now called the tor. Here is how these units compare. 760 tor equals 14.7 psi equals 101.3 kPa. Why are water towers needed on tall buildings? A typical home requires water pressures of 50 to 100 psi. City Water systems use pumps to maintain that pressure in the pipes. Vertical pipes are needed to supply the upper floors with water. Each foot of height reduces the pressure by 0.443 psi. Auxiliary Pumps at various floors can provide the needed increase in pressure. An alternative is to put a large storage tank on the roof and use pumps to fill it. It then supplies the building with water under pressure due to the height of the tank. It also allows the pumps to be run to fill it at night when electricity rates may be cheaper. In addition, it provides a backup source of water in case of fire. Small towns, which often use wells as a water source. Use water towers to store water in case there is an interruption in electrical service. It also allows the town to use smaller pumps because the tower can supply the pressure during peak water demands. A typical daily water use is 500 gallons per minute. But this can rise to 2000 gallons a minute in peak times. A tower typically stores one day's worth of water. Water towers such as these in New York City are often placed on top of tall buildings. This way, the force of gravity supplies the water pressure needed to deliver water throughout the building. Why are water towers needed on tall buildings?
a typical home requires water pressures of 50 to 100 psi. City Water systems use pumps to maintain that pressure in the pipes. Vertical pipes are needed to supply the upper floors with water. Each foot of height reduces the pressure by 0.443 psi. Auxiliary Pumps at various floors can provide the needed increase in pressure. An alternative is to put a large storage tank on the roof and use pumps to fill it. It then supplies the building with water under pressure due to the height of the tank. It also allows the pumps to be run to fill it at night when electricity rates may be cheaper. In addition, it provides a backup source of water in case of fire. Small towns, which often use wells as a water source. Use water towers to store water in case there is an interruption in electrical service. It also allows the town to use smaller pumps because the Tower can supply the pressure during peak water demands. A typical daily water use is 500 gallons per minute. But this can rise to 2000 gallons a minute in peak times. A tower typically stores one day's worth of water. Water towers such as these in New York City are often placed on top of tall buildings. This way, the force of gravity supplies the water pressure needed to deliver water throughout the building. Why are many water towers placed on high towers? The height of the water determines the pressure. Since a holding tank is up high, it places a lot of pressure on the water in the rest of the water network. The tank should be as large across as possible so that for the same amount of water the vertical dimension of the tank can be as small as practicable. This design limits the variation in pressure as the tank empties or is filled. Why are many water towers placed on high towers? The height of the water determines the pressure. Since a holding tank is up high, it places a lot of pressure on the water in the rest of the water network. The tank should be as large across as possible so that for the same amount of water the vertical dimension of the tank can be as small as practicable. This design limits the variation in pressure as the tank empties or is filled. Why do your ears hurt when you dive to the bottom of a swimming pool? Just as the weight of the air above us creates atmospheric pressure. The weight of water creates liquid pressure. Close to the surface of a pool there is very little water that can push down and increase water pressure. The further a person dives below the surface, however, the greater the water pressure. The eardrums are especially sensitive to the increased pressure. For they do not have the reinforcement that the diver's skin has. In fact, your eardrums can usually feel pressure when diving just 1.5 to 3 meters. 
5 to 10 feet, below the surface of the water. Feet, deep or in the ocean at a depth of 10 meters, 32 feet. Although the ocean contains a lot more water than a lake, it is the depth that determines the weight of water directly over a diver that defines the amount of pressure the diver experiences. Therefore, a diver who is 20 meters below the surface of a lake will experience more pressure. In fact, twice the pressure, than the ocean diver experiences at 10 meters. Salt water is denser than fresh water, but the increase in pressure caused by the increased density is small in comparison to that caused by the difference in depth. Why do your ears hurt when you dive to the bottom of a swimming pool? Just as the weight of the air above us creates atmospheric pressure. The weight of water creates liquid pressure. Close to the surface of a pool there is very little water that can push down and increase water pressure. The further a person dives below the surface, however, the greater the water pressure. The eardrums are especially sensitive to the increased pressure. For they do not have the reinforcement that the diver's skin has. In fact, your eardrums can usually feel pressure when diving just 1.5 to 3 meters. 5 to 10 feet, below the surface of the water. Feet, deep or in the ocean at a depth of 10 meters, 32 feet. Although the ocean contains a lot more water than a lake, it is the depth that determines the Weight of water directly over a diver that defines the amount of pressure the diver experiences. Therefore, a diver who is 20 meters below the surface of a lake will experience more pressure. In fact, twice the pressure, than the ocean diver experiences at 10 meters. Salt water is denser than fresh water, but the increase in pressure caused by the Increased density is small in comparison to that caused by the difference in depth. Why are dams thicker at the bottom than at the top? Dams hold back bodies of water and water pressure increases with the depth of the body of water. So the pressure from the water pushing horizontally on the dam is greater at the bottom than at the top. If holes were bored near the bottom, middle, and top of a dam, the longest horizontal stream of water would fire out through the bottom hole because the water pressure is greatest there. Why are dams thicker at the bottom than at the top? Dams hold back bodies of water, and water pressure increases with the depth of the body of water. So the pressure from the water pushing horizontally on the dam is greater at the bottom than at the top. If holes were bored near the bottom, middle, and top of a dam, the longest horizontal stream of water would fire out through the bottom hole because the water pressure is greatest there.
What does it mean to measure your blood pressure? Blood pressure is the pressure your blood exerts on the walls of your arteries. The fluid dynamics of blood play a major role in blood pressure. The heart is the pump that moves the blood throughout the body. With vessels carrying the blood to different sections of the body. The device used to measure blood pressure is the sphygmomanometer. It is placed around the upper arm, inflated, and then deflated. While a meter measures the pressure passing through that section of the arm and either. A person using a stethoscope or an electronic sensor detects the pulse. What does it mean to measure your blood pressure? Blood pressure is the pressure your blood exerts on the walls of your arteries. The fluid dynamics of blood play a major role in blood pressure. The heart is the pump that moves the blood throughout the body. With vessels carrying the blood to different sections of the body. The device used to measure blood pressure is the sphygmomanometer. It is placed around the upper arm, inflated, and then deflated. While a meter measures the pressure passing through that section of the arm and either. A person using a stethoscope or an electronic sensor detects the pulse. Why is your blood pressure taken from your upper arm? Liquid pressure is dependent on the depth of the fluid. Since blood pressure can't be measured around the heart, and the depth of the fluid must be the same as the heart. Doctors and nurses need to find a location at the same depth as the heart. A convenient location at that level is your upper arm. When lying down, however, your blood pressure can be taken just about anywhere. Since most of the blood is at the same vertical level as the heart. The cuff is inflated until no pulse can be heard. It is then slowly lowered. As the pressure falls below the systolic pressure the pulse can be heard. When it's below the diastolic pressure the pulse gets weaker. The report 120 over 70 means that the systolic pressure is 120 tor, the diastolic pressure 70 tor. Why is your blood pressure taken from your upper arm? Liquid pressure is dependent on the depth of the fluid. Since blood pressure can't be measured around the heart, and the depth of the fluid must be the same as the heart. Doctors and nurses need to find a location at the same depth as the heart. A convenient location at that level is your upper arm. When lying down, however, your blood pressure can be taken just about anywhere. Since most of the blood is at the same vertical level as the heart. The cuff is inflated until no pulse can be heard. It is then slowly lowered. 
as the pressure falls below the systolic pressure the pulse can be heard. When it's below the diastolic pressure the pulse gets weaker. The report 120 over 70 means that the systolic pressure is 120 tor, the diastolic pressure 70 tor. How is the pressure of a gas similar to liquid pressure? The pressure from a gas, acts the same way liquid pressure does. One difference between gaseous and liquid pressure is that gases are about 1 slash 1000 as dense as liquids and therefore apply less pressure. The second difference is that gases can be easily compressed while the compressibility of liquid is very small. How is the pressure of a gas similar to liquid pressure? The pressure from a gas, acts the same way liquid pressure does. One difference between gaseous and liquid pressure is that gases are about 1 slash 1000 as dense as liquids and therefore apply less pressure. The second difference is that gases can be easily compressed while the compressibility of liquid is very small. What is the atmospheric pressure? Earth's atmosphere extends approximately 100 kilometers, 328,000 feet above the ground, but it gets less and less dense as the altitude increases. If the density were constant, then the atmosphere would be about 8 km high, 26,246 feet. Close to the height of MT Everest. Some 63% of the atmosphere is below that height. The amount of force on an area of 1 square meter is about 101,300 newtons. That is, the pressure is 101.3 kPa. Atmospheric pressure varies with temperature and other conditions. Our weather is mostly influenced by high and low pressure regions, which can deviate by about 5% from normal. The pressure decreases as your altitude increases because the amount of air above you creating the pressure is smaller. At an altitude of 3 kilometers, 10,000 feet. Above sea level the atmospheric pressure is about 70% of what it is at sea level. At 100 kilometers it is 3 millionths of the sea level pressure. What is the atmospheric pressure? Earth's atmosphere extends approximately 100 kilometers, 328,000 feet above the ground, but it gets less and less dense as the altitude increases. If the density were constant, then the atmosphere would be about 8 km high, 26,246 feet. Close to the height of MT Everest.
some 63% of the atmosphere is below that height. The amount of force on an area of 1 square meter is about 100 and 1300 newtons. That is, the pressure is 101.3 kPa. Atmospheric pressure varies with temperature and other conditions. Our weather is mostly influenced by high and low pressure regions. Which can deviate by about 5% from normal. The pressure decreases as your altitude increases because the amount of air above you creating the pressure is smaller. At an altitude of 3 kilometers, 10,000 feet. Above sea level the atmospheric pressure is about 70% of what it is at sea level. At 100 kilometers it is 3 millionths of the sea level pressure. What are the bends? Nitrogen under normal atmospheric pressure is nearly insoluble in blood. Under pressure, the solubility increases. Thus, as a diver goes deeper the blood holds more and more nitrogen. Which dissolves in the blood during gas exchange in the lungs. As the diver ascends, the pressure decreases, and hence the blood is now supersaturated with nitrogen. The supersaturated nitrogen forms bubbles as it comes out of solution in the blood, or cells. These bubbles collect in veins and arteries. They cause pain, and can rupture cell walls and block the flow of blood to cells. Causing injury or even death. The best way to avoid the bends is to rise to the water surface slowly. Allowing the liquid pressure from the water to gradually decrease and prevent any physical damage. Most scuba divers use nitrox that contains 35% oxygen and 65% nitrogen. Rather than normal air that contains 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen, to reduce, but not eliminate the possibility of getting the bends. What are the bends? Nitrogen under normal atmospheric pressure is nearly insoluble in blood. Under pressure, the solubility increases. Thus, as a diver goes deeper the blood holds more and more nitrogen. Which dissolves in the blood during gas exchange in the lungs. As the diver ascends, the pressure decreases, and hence the blood is now supersaturated with nitrogen. The supersaturated nitrogen forms bubbles as it comes out of solution in the blood, or cells. These bubbles collect in veins and arteries. They cause pain, and can rupture cell walls and block the flow of blood to cells. Causing injury or even death. The best way to avoid the bends is to rise to the water surface slowly. Allowing the liquid pressure from the water to gradually decrease and prevent any physical damage. Most scuba divers use nitrox that contains 35% oxygen and 65% nitrogen. Rather than normal air that contains 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen, to reduce, but not eliminate the possibility of getting the bends.
How is atmospheric pressure measured? A device to measure gas pressure is called a barometer. There are two major types of barometers, the mercury barometer and the aneroid barometer. Galileo's secretary, Evangelista Torricelli, 1606-1647, the unit of pressure. The tour, was named after him, developed the mercury barometer in 1643. It consists of a thin glass tube about 80 centimeters, 31 inches, long, which is closed at the top. Filled with liquid mercury and placed upside down in another mercury-filled dish. Depending upon the atmospheric pressure pushing on the mercury in the dish. The level of mercury in the tube will rise or fall because there is no air above it. By measuring the height of the mercury, which would usually be between 737 and 775 mm. 29 to 30.5 inches, high, atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere can be measured. The most common household barometer is the aneroid barometer. In which atmospheric pressure bends the elastic top of an extremely low pressure drum. By measuring the amount the top bends, a measurement of atmospheric pressure can be determined. The aneroid barometer is often used in airplane altimeters to measure altitude. Since atmospheric pressure decreases as altitude increases. The aneroid barometer is an ideal instrument to use. It is much safer than the mercury barometer. Because mercury vapor is poisonous and the mercury must be exposed to the atmosphere. How is atmospheric pressure measured? A device to measure gas pressure is called a barometer. There are two major types of barometers, the mercury barometer and the aneroid barometer. Galileo's secretary, Evangelista Torricelli, 1606 to 1647, the unit of pressure. The tour, was named after him, developed the mercury barometer in 1643. It consists of a thin glass tube about 80 centimeters, 31 inches, long, which is closed at the top. Filled with liquid mercury and placed upside down in another mercury-filled dish. Depending upon the atmospheric pressure pushing on the mercury in the dish. The level of mercury in the tube will rise or fall because there is no air above it. By measuring the height of the mercury, which would usually be between 737 and 775 mm. 29 to 30.5 inches, high, atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere can be measured. The most common household barometer is the aneroid barometer. In which atmospheric pressure bends the elastic top of an extremely low pressure drum. By measuring the amount the top bends, a measurement of atmospheric pressure can be determined. The aneroid barometer is often used in airplane altimeters to measure altitude. Since atmospheric pressure decreases as altitude increases. The aneroid barometer is an ideal instrument to use. It is much safer than the mercury barometer. 
because mercury vapor is poisonous and the mercury must be exposed to the atmosphere. How is atmospheric pressure measured? A device to measure gas pressure is called a barometer. There are two major types of barometers, the mercury barometer and the aneroid barometer. Galileo's secretary, Evangelista Torricelli, 1606-1647, the unit of pressure. The tour, was named after him, developed the mercury barometer in 1643. It consists of a thin glass tube about 80 centimeters, 31 inches, long, which is closed at the top. Filled with liquid mercury and placed upside down in another mercury-filled dish. Depending upon the atmospheric pressure pushing on the mercury in the dish. The level of mercury in the tube will rise or fall because there is no air above it. By measuring the height of the mercury, which would usually be between 737 and 775 millimeters, 29 to 30.5 inches high, atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere can be measured. The most common household barometer is the aneroid barometer, in which atmospheric pressure bends the elastic top of an extremely low pressure drum. By measuring the amount the top bends, a measurement of atmospheric pressure can be determined. The aneroid barometer is often used in airplane altimeters to measure altitude. Since atmospheric pressure decreases as altitude increases, the aneroid barometer is an ideal instrument to use. It is much safer than the mercury barometer. Because mercury vapor is poisonous and the mercury must be exposed to the atmosphere. What does it mean to say that water seeks its own level? The surface of water placed in a single container, a glass or a bathtub or a lake, will remain at the same level relative to earth on both sides of the container. Adding water to one side will only make the entire level uniformly rise. There can never be one section of the glass or tub or lake that is at a higher elevation than another section. To understand this fact, consider adding the small cube of water on top of the surface at one location. It would exert a downward force on the water under it. But, because water can flow, water under it would flow outward. Raising the level elsewhere in the container until the pressure is equal everywhere. Water also seeks its own level in other containers. If you fill a hose or tube with water and hold the tube in a U shape, the water level will be at the same locations in the two ends. You can use the YouTube to make a device to show you equal heights at two different locations. You may have a coffee maker that has a water height indicator on the side. This is a small tube that connects to the water reservoir at the bottom. The water level in the narrow tube and the wide reservoir is the same. Where did the term horsepower originate?
The term horsepower came from Scottish inventor James Watt. The value for a unit of horsepower was determined after. Watt made an extensive study of horses pulling coal. He originally determined that the average horse was able to lift 33. 000 pounds of coal one foot in one minute. The conversion between watts and horsepower, HP, is that 1 HP equals 746 W equals 0.746 kilowatts. In the United States automobile engines are rated in horsepower while in the rest of the world kilowatts are used. In a hybrid car the power of the gasoline engine is usually measured in HP while the electric motor is measured in KW. How is energy measured? The SI unit for energy is the Joule, J, but energy is often measured in other units. The calorie, Cal, and the kilocalorie, KCal. Or food calorie are used both for chemical energy stored in foods and to measure heat. The British thermal unit, BTU, is most often used to measure heat in homes and industries. The kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour, is used to measure electrical energy. A completely unofficial, but useful unit is the jelly donut. JD, the energy in a medium sized jelly filled donut. It helps relate all these units to a tasty treat. The table below illustrates conversions among the units. To use it read across. For example, 1J equals 0.239 calories, 1 calorie equals 4.186J, 1JD equals 239 kilocalories. In comparing fuels used to heat a home, natural gas, electricity, fuel oil, and wood, more has to be considered than just the cost of the fuel per mj of energy. The furnaces that distribute the heated air or water have quite varied efficiencies themselves. What are composite materials? As was mentioned above, brittle materials like concrete have larger compressive strength than tensile strength. For that reason reinforcing bars, rebars, made of steel are embedded in concrete. The steel supports the concrete when it is under tension, reducing its tendency to crack and thus keeping it from failing. Composite materials have been used since ancient times when straw was added to clay to make bricks. The most recent composite materials use carbon fibers, less than 0.01 mm in diameter, that are light in weight. They're made of pure carbon, with very high tensile strength but low compressive strength. They are added to plastics to make them more rigid, increase their Young's modulus, without adding weight. Golf club shafts are often made of a plastic filled with carbon fibers. Giving the shaft great strength with low weight. By varying the amount of carbon fibers the flexibility of the shaft can be changed. Although it isn't really a composite, 
glass can be made to be less brittle. The key idea is to keep the surface under compression at all times so it won't crack. Glass sheets are made from the fluid state by cooling. If the surfaces are cooled quickly with strong blasts of air it produces a form of glass called case hardened that was used for shatterproof lenses in eye glasses. In the 1970s a chemical method was invented that could be used on cold glass. It involves putting the glass into a bath of potassium salts. The potassium replaces sodium in the surface layers of the glass. The larger potassium atoms expand the surface layers so that the interior portion of the glass compresses the surface, keeping it from developing cracks. What does energy efficiency mean? In most cases thermal energy is not a useful form of energy for a system. You want the energy content in the gasoline in your auto to give it kinetic energy, not to make it hotter. The cooling system uses a water antifreeze mixture to cool the engine and warm the radiator. Where air flowing through it is heated, thus cooling the fluid. The thermal energy in the heated air is often called rejected or waste energy. An auto is about 20% efficient. That is. Only one-fifth of the energy in the gasoline is converted into the kinetic energy of the auto. In addition to the hot air from the engine, tires get warm from flexing. And the brakes get hot when they are applied. All this thermal energy is rejected or waste energy. Your home furnace converts the chemical energy in oil or gas or electrical energy into thermal energy. Either of air or water, depending on whether you have forced air heat or hot water radiators. But not all the energy goes into heating the house. Some leaves through the chimney as rejected or waste energy. Heating systems used to be about 60% efficient. Newer systems can be as much as 95% efficient. Means of increasing the efficiency of auto and home appliances is an active area. Of research as nations try to conserve as much of the produced energy as they can. Your body also uses only a fraction, again about 20% of the food energy to move your limbs when you walk or run. Your body is cooled by contact with the air or by evaporating liquid either perspiration or the humid air expelled by your lungs. <laughs>